Data-driven design is the future of architecture. And that's exactly why you should start all of your projects with Autodesk Forma, the sponsor of today's video. A few weeks ago, I showed you exactly how to use Autodesk Forma. Now I'm gonna show you how to implement this in a real world scenario. So what I'm gonna do is bring up a recent design and showcase exactly my thought process and my procedures moving from start to finish and how I used Autodesk Forma to implement the strategy behind it. Now, because this is a real world example, I'll blank out the street names for some privacy for my clients. But let's go ahead and hit that confirm map area and let it start loading. I've chosen this specific site and this specific project because it is completely exposed. It is on a hill, it is surrounded by bushland, and it is facing away from the northern sun. So it isn't exposed to the best sunlight conditions. It is extremely exposed to the environmental conditions, including the wind and the rain. But it's impossible for me to predict this year round, so I do need this information from Autodesk Forma in order to make data-driven design decisions. There are a few things that I'd like to add to this project. Of course, our buildings, our terrain data, and our roads. Now that we have that information imported, we can take a quick look at our overall site and see that we are on the side of a hill. We have a couple main streets and a few internal streets as well, but generally speaking, our site is somewhere over here. With this low level of data, I don't know exactly where my site is. So that's why we wanna turn on our satellite view to be able to define our area properly. If we come down to the bottom to our display options and change to satellite, we'll see that rural property come into focus. Now, our buildings have actually not picked up all of these sheds and houses around in the distance. However, that's not overly critical because our site is over here. We don't actually have much going on next to our site. So let's just simply zoom in and create our site limits. The underlying base layer is a little bit off skew compared to that of our imported road data. But it doesn't really matter because this site is so large, we're not working with tiny parameters. So I'm simply gonna pretend like my site is approximately here and finish off my site. Now, because Autodesk Forma takes into account the contours of the land and the vegetation that's placed in, I wanna go ahead and quickly model all of these vegetation areas. To do that, I'm simply gonna go to vegetation at the top and area with trees. Then I'm gonna draw some of these shapes and introduce some vegetation. Now that I've inputted all of the vegetation, I come back to my contour terrain map and I can see all of the areas of vegetation that I've introduced. Now, these areas, for example, if I click on them, it'll say the vegetation has a height of five meters and a general spacing of five meters as well. What I can do is simply jump on Google Maps, have a quick look at roughly what I think these tree sizes are and adjust accordingly. So that is the next step in my process. So by looking on Google Maps, I can have a quick look at these Australian native trees that are significantly higher than five meters. I'd say there are a good 10 meters for some of the smaller trees and up to 20 meters for some of the larger trees in the background. The spacing is very, very close together as well. So we don't really have a five meter canopy separation anywhere. It is definitely bushfire land, that is for sure. So now we'll jump back into former and update the vegetation height based on what we approximately think is correct. And there we go, within a few seconds, we have our site, we have our topography, and we have our dense vegetation around. Now this information starts to spark some ideas of in which way the design direction could go. However, these are all general assumptions based on experience. What I wanna do is have data-driven design decisions. So that way I can actually inform my clients and improve the livability of the design at the end of the day. So considering the fact that all of this is relatively open, realistically, it's gonna get plenty of sunlight, it's gonna get plenty of wind, it's gonna have its own microclimate, and it's gonna be a unique site. I know for a fact that looking up the page now down the hill is a beautiful ocean view. So we wanna focus all of our outdoor living areas towards that direction. As you can see in the bottom right hand corner, north is to the right of the screen currently positioned. So in the Southern Hemisphere, we want all of our living quarters to be in the north and all of our sleeping quarters generally to be in the south. But we're facing west, we're facing in the complete opposite direction. In this specific area, most of the winds are generally from the west as well. So I know this is going to be a challenging site. So what do we do? Well, let's break it down. This site has a million and one different variations and possibilities. But for me, I like to start with different scenarios of massing configurations. It doesn't matter how tall the massing is, it doesn't matter how wide it is, the general massing in itself will play a role to the end product. 
So let's start by introducing a small basic building. If we simply place an excessively long rectangle in the middle of the block, we can call this proposal one. Then we can go ahead and duplicate that proposal, call this proposal two, and then add an additional element into the design. So let's say we add an additional wing creating an L-shaped massing. We can continue to duplicate this scenario and keep adding massing, changing, rotating, tweaking to write us with a series of different combinations. Now we have five different design proposals in front of us, a very simple linear shape, an L-shaped configuration, a U-shaped configuration, a Z-shaped configuration, and of course, a H-shaped configuration. Now I've used these generic shapes because each one of them has their own architectural justification behind them and considerations from experience. However, without doing some analysis on the site, I'm not entirely certain in which direction to proceed with one of these options. So what I wanna do is go to proposal one, for example, go to my 2D view and start with a wind analysis because I know from this site in particular, the wind is coming most of the time directly from where the view is. So I need to account for that in my design. It is going to be one of the most important factors. So let's come across to our wind analysis. Let's select custom circle and hover directly over our site. Now we can run a detailed analysis which takes 30 to 90 minutes and this will take into account all of the trees and all of the contours and everything in between. But generally speaking, I need to understand which of these configurations work best. So from a starting point, I can take a look at the single linear configuration and understand by the simple color scale representation at the bottom that there is a little bit of sitting area around the side which makes it comfortable for most of the time. If I jump over to proposal two and repeat that process, I can see that that building is starting to shield some of the wind, which if we move to proposal three, we'll once again see that change. In proposal three, I'm starting to create a really nice courtyard that's preventing a lot of the northerlies and southerly winds coming into this space. However, at the same time, I could potentially be creating a small little vortex inside the space. I've created a great pocket for the outdoor entertaining area looking out towards the view, but I still haven't achieved much in the rear entertaining area looking back towards the native bushland. Proposal 4 in that scenario then addresses both elements, but it loses a little bit of that comfort in the U-shaped design we had. So now we're looking at Proposal 5 in a H-shaped configuration, which by far provides the best results from a very quick analysis, which means for me personally, I'll start with the H-shaped proposal and tweak and provide a couple extra alternatives until I'm comfortable. Now we have our original H shape that's been rotated to align with the actual site boundary itself. I've introduced a new Y shape, which is further evolving potentially from that original H shape. As we can see, we're opening up to that view, but we're creating multiple pockets around the home. Now this side obviously is not as well protected as the previous in the H shape. So potentially that Y shape may not be the winner. We also have this odd Y Z shape that's a little bit of a combination in between, but it's attempting to mitigate those winds with one blade for a longer span rather than a shorter one. And finally, by messing with that configuration ever so slightly more, I can understand now that by introducing a small little return at the top of the property, I'm creating a perfect courtyard here. And at the same time, I'm creating a perfect courtyard at the rear. It gives me two ideal, entertaining areas outside at any point of the day. For argument's sake, let's say we're happy with this design here. The first thing I wanna do is start my wind analysis and let that run in the background. So let's just hit run details analysis so we can understand all of the contours and wind maps in greater detail later down the track. At the same time, what I wanna understand is my sunlight hours and my sunlight potential hours. So what we wanna do is start our analysis for sun hours and daylight potential. Of course, the winter is going to be the absolute worst. So June 21st is a winter solstice here in Australia. So I'll run my analysis on those dates. Now in a comparison windows, we can have a deeper understanding of our daylight potential and our sunlight hours. On the left-hand side, we will see our sunlight hours and on the right-hand side, we'll see our daylight potential. Obviously this building is just floating. There's been no consideration into anything below. So we'll see some excessive shading and shadows. Nevertheless, it is going to allow us to understand a few things. 
First of all, if this was our living section here on the left comparison window, which is the right hand longer wing, we would be actually getting the most of our sun. So if we inspect this area, we're getting nine hours of sunlight on that facade, as well as four hours on the front and 4.7 hours on the rear. So overall, we're getting quality amount of sun in the heart of winter. And by separating this U-shape, we're also able to introduce some sun into that rear wing. So if that was a secondary living area, a gym space or anything of that sort, it would be a nice comfortable space. What we can identify through this is of course, that wing is casting a large shadow on this internal courtyard. So on this facade here, for example, we're getting 0% daylight because the sun is never swinging around to that position, which for me indicates this wing would be best served as entirely glass. Three sides of glass would allow plenty of natural light to traverse through the building and actually find its way to this courtyard space. Secondly, I would also be looking at introducing a skylight into this section here. That way we can do away with some of these shadows in the very deep corners of this U-shape. On the other end of the wing, we'll see the same problems of the shadow casting over the ground. So we would definitely be avoiding any vegetable gardens, any play areas, or landscaping that required large amounts of sun and daylight in this section. Now, that is towards the rear of the house. It is not entirely a planned outdoor living area, so that is okay. However, this section at the rear, which we created the perfect outdoor entertaining area, completely shielded from the wind, does have a problem. All of this area down the bottom is not getting any daylight. It is completely hidden from the sun and we're only getting 0.2 hours of daylight. It is a huge opportunity for us to explore. So as you can see, most of that shadow is being cast by the massing of the second story here. If we simply go back into our proposal, drop the massing on that section to a single story, and then rerun our site analysis for sun. We can have our original two story on the left hand side and our new single story on the right hand side. What we'll see is, yes, we still do have that vast shading area. However, we've significantly reduced the shadows cast by the building whilst still protecting ourselves from those winds coming from the north. Finally, what we haven't taken into consideration is obviously the size of this shape. It is way too big for a standard dwelling. We have almost 1,500 square meters of gross floor area. So we need to scale that back down to a more appropriate size utilizing this shape. And in that scenario, we can then start to identify different split levels in the home for this hill. So let's go and duplicate this one last time, reduce the scale and start considering levels. Now I've reduced this to a more manageable size overall. We have just under 500 square meters of gross floor area. And what you'll see is I've reduced each of the spaces, ensuring that they're relatively within the natural parameters of the ground, and also found an opportunity here for a third story. Now, this third story could become the garage in itself, and then we could begin to identify different areas. For instance, this could actually be a double void. It doesn't necessarily have to have anything in it. It could just provide that natural light we're looking for into the backyard, whilst these spaces here could become our main living and residential areas. Now that I've gone ahead and identified the general layout and program of this design, I can actually start thinking about the design itself. Now that I've considered the program of the design, I can finalize by analyzing the rest of our information, like the full wind study and the microclimate, before exploring some additional extensions like the shadow study. By adding in the shadow study prior to going through and analyzing my wind and my microclimate, I can understand any final last tweaks I need to make in the overall scheme. With the shadows, I'm considering my outdoor living spaces as well as my indoor living spaces to maximize the overall project potential. So if I simply hit the preview button, I can understand how the shadows move throughout the day in the middle of winter. I can go ahead and export those images for quick reference later. But overall, I can see my house is casting generally a decent shadow to the rear yard, but I still have plenty of sunlight at the front. If I was to repeat that for the summer solstice, we'll see that the house doesn't cast as much of a grand shadow as it does a winter. And at the same time, that shadow is predominantly over the closer areas of the house. So in summer, I will definitely need some sort of awning, some sort of verandas, some sort of protection to ensure these spaces, especially if they're glass, do not overheat. Finally, I'll run my detailed 
wind analysis and I'll run my detailed microclimate analysis and make any last data driven design decisions before I move in to the floor plan and overall design of what is truly going to be an incredible residential dwelling. Anyway, that's all for me team. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, make sure you smash that subscribe button down below. And like always, I'll see you next week.